Today we'll be looking at just the Bible, Lesson 17, forfeited by physical Israel because of disobedience. By This series of lessons is by Marion Fox, and it's taught by me, Chris Hill. They were in danger of losing their nation in the days of Moses. So this wasn't something new that happened to them. Uh, this people had a history of being disobedient and being disrespectful to the one true God. And next is 32, beginning in verse 9, it reads, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now, leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, then I will make you into a great nation. So now we went back to the days of Moses, and God looks down on the people and says, these folks are stiff-necked. Perhaps if you've worked with animals and you wanted to lead them somewhere and their neck, neck became stiff, it was a way of that animal saying, I don't want to go where you want to lead me. That's what stiff-necked is. It's, it's a stubbornness. It's when we're working with a horse, we have a saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Well, here's the case where you couldn't even lead the horse because the horse is stiff-necked. Well, these people were stiff-necked. They didn't want to be led. They wanted to follow their own desires, which was contrary to what the Lord wanted. And so even here, the Lord saying to Moses, they are stiff-necked. That's really uh, indicating a stubbornness of these people. It's not a good character trait whenever it comes to following God. We want to uh, humbly submit and follow, and we never want to be called stiff-necked when it comes to being disobedient here, uh, to being led by God's word. The only reason God did not destroy them was because he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would make them of a great nation, Exodus 32, 11, and 14. Let's look at verse 11 here. But Moses sought... The favor of the Lord is God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel to whom you swore by your own self I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented <clears throat> and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. When, the, when God was looking at these folks who were stiff-necked, who were stubborn, who were disobedient, when he looked at them, he he was he made the threat, you know, I'm just going to wipe them out. They, they're not, it's not worth working with these folks. I'll just start again. But when he thought back, he looked at Abraham and <clears throat> Isaac and Jacob and the promise he made to them and, and reconsidered and he relented here and he let them live. But we need to keep in, keep in mind that we don't ever want to be known as a stiff necked people when it comes to uh, our willingness to follow God. We want to go wherever he leads us. And how do we know where that is? We, we find that in the Bible. And we learn how the Lord wants us to live and how we should be directed by the scriptures to live good, wholesome lives that are honor, honorable and pleasing to God. Well, these folks really deserve to be destroyed. That is what their deeds had earned them. But the Lord didn't do that. And here we have this dialogue where God wrote, reveals why he did not destroy them and start over. He thinks back on those faithful people he made a promise to, and this is why God did not destroy them. God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He could not break the covenant to bless all nations through their seed, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. There was a seed promise, which we've already considered in prior lessons, and there was a nation promise, which we're considering in this lesson and other lessons. And there was a land promise, which will be considered in later lessons. They were repeatedly punished for sin. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 29 and verse 6, our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. Here, Ezra is going to give a summary of the history of Israel. We see that in 
Ezra 9, 7, and God showed them favor by preserving a remnant. Now, a remnant is a small portion. Perhaps you, you get a bolt of fabric. You get a, a big piece of fabric, and you have a small piece. That'd be a remnant. Even in their punishment, God did not forsake them. He preserved that, that small amount that was faithful there and went from there. So let's look at Ezra here in 9, Ezra 9, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> from the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief to our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness and the side of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of God, the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. Israel returned to their old ways after their return to Jerusalem and the land of Canaan. We find this in Ezra 9 verses 10 and 11. Now God had warned them not to intermarry with the inhabitants of the land. We find that in Ezra 9 and verse 12. Well, why, why not? Well, because these were people who served different gods and they had different motives. They, they had different reasons for going about their ways in life. And it wasn't to honor and praise the one true God. God had warned them not to seek the peace or prosperity of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Ezra 9, 12, their punishment for these sins was less than they really deserved. Ezra 9, 13. Let's take a look at this here. In Ezra 9 and verse 12, Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and have given us a remnant like this. They knew that they deserved to be punished worse, but God was merciful and still was working to bless his children. And his goal for them was to be faithful and to be obedient servants. God warned them that they would receive a deserved punishment if they repeated the sins of their fathers. Ezra 9, 14. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? So what's the reason for the for being forbidden from intermarrying these people here from Canaan? <laughs> well, they committed detestable practices. And in their religion, they did some of the most uh, evil things imaginable. He says, don't be joined with these evil people. Don't go make a peace treaty with them. Don't intermarry with them. They do detestable things. And when you get close to people like this, those habits they have are going to rub off on you. He's saying, don't stay away from these folks. Don't intermarry with them. You can't, you can't do that. It won't be good for you spiritually. Well, the days of Ezra, they returned to these sins, Ezra 9, 15 and following. Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant of, here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, none of us can stand in your presence. So this history they had continued many times. It would be repeated where they would turn away from God and do the things that he commanded them not to do. But God is faithful. And so we're going to see how this works out. Let's go on in our text here with lesson 18. God divorced Israel and probably Judah Israel 50, uh, Isaiah 50 and verse 1, and this is around 720 BC. Once God divorced Israel and she married another God, he cannot take her back. We find this from Jeremiah 3 and verse 1. And this is around 600 BC. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? Would not the land be completely defiled? But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. Would you now return to me? Wow, what a description uh, that's set forth and what imagery is put forth here. Well, this law is set forth in Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4. 
If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. So this goes back to Deuteronomy, but he has a big picture of this and uses God uses himself here in the illustration. Now, God is always faithful, but we already know who isn't. The a fortiori principle applies this to God and his wife Israel. First premise, if a man sins when he takes back a wife remarries her after she is divorced and married to another man, then God sins when he takes back his wife, Israel, after she is divorced and married to another God. Second premise, a man sins when he takes back a wife, remarries her after she is divorced and married to another man. Conclusion, God sins when he takes back his wife, Israel, after she is divorced and married to another God. Well, obviously this is false because God does not sin. <clears throat> God had clearly divorced Israel. We find this in Jeremiah 3.8. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. You see, there should have been a lesson learned from Judah. You have Israel. We consider that the 10 tribes in the north and Judah, the two tribes in the south. And so while Israel is going through all its struggles, going through all the things that it went through because it abandoned God and, and basically here committed adultery on God by serving other gods and all these consequences that came, all the struggles Israel went through, being carried off and plundered, being wiped out, Judah is right below there, the two, the two southern tribes. They could look and see all the struggles Israel was going through but they didn't learn the lessons from that. They should have witnessed and said, wow, uh, this is because they did not stay faithful to God. These punishments are happening. These terrible things are happening because they were not faithful to God. Now, we don't want that to happen to us down here in Judah, so we should really strengthen our faith. We should really double down and commit ourselves to serve the one true God of heaven and stay away from all these idols, stay away from these people who are idol worshipers, these folks who are doing detestable things. We should not take on any of their practices. Yet when all this happened, they could look at Israel, the 10 northern tribes, see all the bad things that were happening because of their sin, but Judah paid no attention. In fact, they just followed the same steps that Israel did. Isn't that a terrible thing? Sometimes we see that in families where <clears throat> one person, maybe uh, <clears throat> one of the sons goes off and, and commits some, some kind of sin and does something wrong, and yet the other sibling doesn't learn from that. So we really have to learn the lessons that others make and not follow in their footsteps, not follow in their sins. Well, just as Hosea provided for Gomer's needs, God provided for Israel until he married spiritual Israel. God was no longer Israel's husband, Hosea 2.2. 2. Rebuke her mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife. I am not her husband. Let her read the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. God would betroth the faithful remnant to him, Hosea 2.23-23. Fourteen. I'll let you look that up there and read that story because it is very, very touching here as we see this, um, to see God's faithfulness in, in this being told here and the tragedy is behind this, this scripture reading. God would save the remnant of the Jews, Hosea 2, 14 through 20, and note that there was to be a future covenant, Hosea 2, 18. Note that there was to be a betrothal, <clears throat> Hosea 2, 19 and 20, which implies that he would have a new marriage. The prophecy that they would know Jehovah and have a new covenant is given again in Jeremiah 31 through 34. 
Put it in Hebrews 8, 8 through 13, and chapter 10, verses 15 through 18. We're gonna, we can read about that new covenant. Well, God would save the obedient Gentiles, Hosea 2, 21 through 23. The words of Hosea 2, 21 through 22 are figurative language referring to God's blessings, spiritual Israel. This verse, Hosea 2, 23, is quoted in Romans 9, 25 and applied to both the Jews and the Gentiles who obeyed God. Verse 25, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. So we see here the key is obedience. Several doctrines are tied together in Hosea chapter 3, 1 through 5. Hosea is instructed to purchase back Gomer, but she would not be any man's wife. Obviously, this includes Hosea. This is applied in Hosea 3 and verse 4 to the children of Israel. After this period of time, the children of Israel shall return and seek God and David their king. Jesus is represented by David, Hosea 3, 5. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his and to his blessings in the last days. Sometimes we have to learn lessons the hard way, but wouldn't it be easier to learn the lessons from others who have fallen away, who have disobeyed God and seen those consequences? And wouldn't it be easier to learn the lessons from others and to see the benefits it is to stay faithful to God and not go astray? Wouldn't it have been great if, if Judah would have learned the lessons from seeing Israel, the northern tribes, falling because of their sin and realize we shouldn't take that path. Look where it leads. And yet people were stubborn and they ended up following the same path of Israel. I want to encourage you all to look at the lessons that we learn in the lives of people here in the scriptures, even entire nations, and do our best not to follow a path that leads to destruction, but the path that leads towards God where we receive his blessings and we go and live our lives to honor and praise him. That concludes our lesson today.